Lee, uh, your host for this evening. Welcome to another series of monthly program meetings sponsored by the Woods and Wetlands Group of the Illinois chapter of the Sierra Club. All of our online meetings are free and open to the public, though registration is required. You will find us online at 7 p.m. on the second Sunday of every month. In a moment, we will hear from our featured speakers this evening, our very own Gloria Charland and Jim Bland, both of whom are subject matter experts on the uh, subject of blue-green algae. They're going to speak to us on the plague of this toxic uh, uh, chemical in some of our lakes, or chemicals, I should say. First, though, we have a couple of brief administrative announcements. As Doug said, we are recording this so that you can watch it in the future. Please make sure if that you are muted, especially if you have a barking dog, a television, or some other commotion in the background. And that includes the Bears game. I think the Bears uh, kick off at seven o'clock right about now, if I'm not mistaken. Also, please feel free to ask any questions of our speaker by using the chat room at the bottom of your screen. We will select questions afterward and put them to the speaker, or speakers, I should say. Finally, you will want to make a, a note of our next meeting on October 10th, we will hear from Ann Lacey, who manages the North American program for the International Crane Foundation. Now she's going to speak to us on the successful efforts to save the Sandhill Crane and the whoop, Whooping Crane. Uh, so we're uh, especially looking forward to Ann's presentation on October 10th. Don't miss that one. Now let's move on to our featured presentation for this evening. We are so very fortunate to welcome our very own Gloria Charland and Jim Bland to our virtual podium tonight. They are subject matter experts on toxic blue-green algae. They will explain how algal blooms come about, what dangers they pose, and how we can mitigate the problem. Uh, now, out of my own limited understanding, and I hope to and expect to learn a lot more tonight, algal blooms come from cyanobacteria, Jim and, and Gloria, correct me if I'm wrong on this. Uh, it's a single-celled photosynthetic bacterium. According to Wikipedia, cyanobacteria produce a range of toxins known as cyanotoxins that can pose a danger to humans and animals. Algae is aggravated by the use of fertilizer on nearby farmland. Gloria is the co-chair of the Squaw Creek Clean Water Alliance a volunteer-led watershed group in Western Lake County. For the past six years, she has been involved in extensive research on algal blooms, their causes, and mitigation methods. Jim Bland is a former official of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. The two of them have worked together on four watershed research studies on the Squaw Creek watershed in Western Lake County. They are longtime members of the Woods and Wetlands Group of the Illinois chapter of the Sierra Club. Gloria and Jim will be discussing cyanobacteria, what they are, how you can identify them, and why they are dangerous to human and animal health and ecosystems. They will suggest ways in which you can personally advocate for clean water. This presentation is another in a series of popular online programs offered by the Woods and Wetlands Group of the Illinois chapter of the Sierra Club. It's free and open to the public, like all of our programs, the registration is required. Again, feel free to ask any questions of our speakers by using the chat room at the bottom of your screen. And remember to stay online afterward to learn how you can get more involved in the Sierra Club. Gloria and Jim, welcome to our Sunday speaker series. The microphone is all yours. All right, I think I'm sharing here. Oh, there we go. Uh, toxic blue-green algae 101, an involving environmental, an evolving environmental problem. Oh, that didn't work. There we go. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start with a little introduction to cyanobacteria, friend or foe, why do we care, effects on humans, and why are they getting worse? Then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, identification, common attributes, field data, and microscopic data. 
then Jim's going to take over and talk about toxins, relative toxicities, modes of operation, and BMAA, all of which you'll know what that means when he gets there. And uh, then we'll come back to me and I'll be talking about mitigation, external loading, internal loading, and advocacy. It's here. So three and a half million years ago, blue-green algae or cyanobacteria was the only life form on earth. This is supposed to be a picture of primordial soup here. Um, after some evolution, cyanobacteria learned how to take electrons from the water, photosynthesize, and create a byproduct called oxygen. Without cyanobacteria, we would not have an atmosphere. They are still simple, ancient, ancient one-celled creatures with no nuclei, no cell wall, nor many other cell structures. They are in fresh water and salt water. They are in hot springs and under ice pack. They are in soil and on desert rocks, and they are not always toxic. So why do we care? First off, never let your dog swim in something that looks like this. There were seven deaths this summer in Austin, Texas alone from cyanobacteria. Uh, cyanobacteria blooms can produce toxins that kill pets, livestock, waterfowl, and humans. The biomass of a bloom can tank oxygen levels and cause fish kills. Our drinking water facilities need to test and treat for toxicity, taste, and odor. And they are everywhere, India, Africa, Europe, Australia. In fact, 70% of the fresh water bodies in the United States are eutrophic or over-fertilized and are capable of producing a toxic algal bloom. There is a documented case in Brazil where contaminated water was used to produce a dialysis solution and more than 50 people died. Also, there is one documented swimming death in the United States uh, where five teen soccer players hopped a fence at a golf course in Wisconsin to swim in the pond. All developed symptoms and one died. There are relationships between toxin exposure and tumors and colon cancer. More testing needs to be done to determine the long-term effects of exposure. Remember, no one got lung cancer from one pack of cigarettes. And if these toxins are killing dogs, cattle, and even elephants in a matter of hours, what are they doing to humans long-term? And they're getting worse. Dog deaths were virtually unheard of 20 years ago. So what is changing? Well, surprise, humans are messing up the planet. Thanks to global warming, the water is warmer. The growing season is longer and global warming creates flooding in many areas which washes more nutrients into lakes, streams and rivers. Humankind is also responsible for overbuilding more rooftops, more parking, tops, parking lots, and more roads create more runoff. Dr. Ann St. A man from Phycotech in Michigan who studies this stuff for a living says that every year new species are discovered. She's not sure if this is because more species are evolving or if we are just able to look for them better. So what are we looking for? Uh, we need to know what we're looking for in order to avoid them, right? A good rule of thumb is when in doubt, stay out. But here's a little more to go on. An algae bloom is loosely defined as visible color. Usually they are green or blue green, but can be pink or brown. With algae on the surface or in the water column, there will be poor visibility or increased turbidity, and often there is a foul odor 
which can be described as musty, grassy, or like an open sewer. Here's a close up on that last picture. Yes, this is a visible color, but no, it's not a cyanobacteria. The stick test shows that this is duckweed. Oh, you can see that. Can see that. Yeah. yeah. There, ooh, we're zooming. Um, duckweed is the world's smallest flowering plant. It is native, and of course, ducks love it. An overabundance of duckweed can indicate high nitrogen content in the water. But from a distance, I can't tell duckweed from blue-green algae. Here's another example. We have color, we have a bloom, but no, it's not cyanobacteria. This is called water meal. It's in the duckweed family and they often occur together. I just love this slimy stuff here. Also, not a cyanobacteria. The stick test shows us that this is a green filamentous algae. There's a couple of spots of duckweed thrown in and uh, oh, some nice lily pads. Oh, here we go. This is a cyanobacteria bloom. Sometimes it can look like spilled paint on the surface of the water. See that spilled paint. And here's my stick test. Um, I was able to pick up some of the scum. Uh, they do rise to the surface and sometimes you can pick up scum. Here's another example. And yeah, here I had more trouble picking up the scum. Here's one for you. So we've got visible color. It's uh, blue, blue green, kind of looks like spilled paint, but it's also three dimensional. See all those lumps? Any guesses? Um, it's both. This, uh, we had, we had uh, filamentous algae blowing in here. You can see it hanging off my stick. And then the uh, toxic cyanobacteria washed in. It makes a lovely mess. Again, when in doubt, stay out. Always do a visual check before you enter the water or let your dogs or children in. This is the jar test. While cyanobacteria does not have flagellates or other, other structures to use to move, they can and do rise and sink using air vacuoles called aerotypes. If you leave a cyanobacteria sample in a jar like I did for a few hours, it will rise to the top. So let's identify a few of the most common cyanos. Microcystis is one of the most common cyanobacterium in the Midwest. And per Dr. Todd Miller, the most common cause of toxic algal blooms in the world. Uh, here's what it looks like in the field. This poor little bird splashing in it. Uh, here's your jar test. And here it is under a microscope. Even with the naked eye, you can see how the cells will clump together and they look like tiny green cotton balls. This is a phanazomenon. A phanazomenon forms these long filaments and no, you should not put your hand in the water like this guy did. Uh, under a microscope, you can see that the filaments will join together here, uh, a phenomenon called rafting. With the naked eye, a phanazomenon looks like tiny pieces of cut grass. And yes, it can be very toxic. This is dolicospermum, which used to be called anabena. Uh, another common genus, it forms filaments like a phanazomenon, but the different species take on different shapes, but it always looks like a string of pearls. 
Dolichospermum crassum forms these nice little curly cues. Dolichospermum planktic, planktonicum forms these straighter strands. And Dolichospermum lemur, oh, I can say this, lemur mani forms these big wads of uh, like a bowl of spaghetti that are easy to confuse with microcystis if you don't have a powerful microscope. And this is what we usually get in the field. Yeah, that's me with no glove on, I know. Um, so we have all three of them here in our sample, microcystis, a fan is aminon, dolichospermum. You can see these uh, little grass clippings here. That's the aphanizomenon. These like puffy cotton balls are the microcystis. And uh, it's, oh, you can see them pretty good. Um, these little curly cues are the dolichospermum. They often occur together. Uh, in fact, a phanazomenon fixes nitrogen that it takes from the air and leaks it. Microcystis does not produce, does not fix its own nitrogen and it will use the nitrogen that the phanazomenon leaks. I have a little close up here of the dolichospermum. It also fixes its own nit nitrogen. See that? Ta da! It, you can't really see the string of pearls. We need a, a stronger microscope. Oh, this is a fun one. So all four of these sample jars contain cyanobacteria. Which bottle here do you think contains the most toxins? Number three. <laughs> ha, after we tested them, none of them were toxic. We were actually shocked ourselves. The only way to know if a cyanobacteria is toxic is to test it. Cyanobacterias have a gene that can switch on and start producing toxins. Scientists are still trying to figure out what stimulates that switch. And now we're going to go to Jim, who's going to talk about toxins. I'll stop sharing. Is Jim there? Yes, Jim is here. Uh, Gloria mentioned the business that we're really finding out a lot more about toxic blue-green algae of one form or another, and that it's an evolving science. Uh, and uh, th that's exceptionally important. Number one, we're finding out more about the physiology behind uh, the toxicity that exists. There's also uh, research work th that relates nitrogen uh, types of compounds to uh, cyanobacteria toxicity as well. What you see in this first slide is uh, a comparison of the relative toxicity of different types of cyanobacterial toxins. Now, in order to do this, what they did is they took uh, a syringe and they injected the particular type of compound that you see in that list into mice, into a population of mice. And LD50, <clears throat> is what you see up here, represents the lethal dose for 50% of that mice, of that mouse population. So what they're comparing it to, up here, you see saxitoxin, which does occur and freshwater types of cyanobacteria, you see the dose, the LD50 dose, and lower is more toxic. And here you have ricin, which is one of the more uh, potent to uh, uh, poisons that we know of. 
So the relative toxicity of some of these compounds that are um, uh, produced by various types of cyanobacteria is very, very substantial. Anatoxin A uh, is going to be more common than saxitoxin. Here, it's being compared with cobra venom. And here you see the LD50 is 20 micrograms per, uh, per I wanna say 20 micrograms per kilogram. Uh, as you go down, microcystin LR is the most common. Uh, Gloria mentioned that and it is found uh, widely. And what you see is there's more than one type of um, cyanobacteria that uh, produces microcystin. So it's common, you, you find it in microcystis, which is the, the one uh, cyanobacteria that is most common for it, but it is found in other types of cyanobacteria as well. Here it's compared to sarin, uh, which is the gas, the sarin gas that you have here. All of these things are done as an intraperitoneal injection in, uh, in the mice. So uh, that winds up as being important because the mode of how uh, these things experience the exposure is important. But you get the idea of how the relative toxicity of some of these things. Cylindrospermopsin is new on the... Uh, uh, on the horizon. It's an example of a cyanobacteria that was growing down south, but what's happening is we're seeing it more and more in freshwater lakes as you come up north. Going back to saxitoxin, you're probably familiar with it in a way because it's the toxin that's associated with pufferfish. It's also a part and, and parcel of uh, the sorts of things that are associated with red tide. But apart from red tide, it's also found in some freshwater context. The factors influencing express toxicity. One is the form and the chemical activity of the different types of things. The two major groups that are responsible for most of the toxicity. Uh, on the, one of them is alkaloids and the other are peptides. You're probably familiar with alkaloids and you probably had some before viewing this Zoom presentation. Uh, they're in caffeine, they're in, co in co codeine, they're in um, a whole variety, uh, they're in morphine, nicotine, cocaine, all of those are highly active, bioactive compounds that are alkaloids. Peptides are made from amino acids. And what you see here is an amino acid. It's got one nitrogen portion to it that's part of the amino portion, and it's got one acid portion that's here. The amino acids and the pe peptides are important. What you have in a peptide is a string of amino acids tied together, but it's smaller than a protein. The proteins are large strings of amino acids tied together. And there are only 20 types of amino acids that are responsible for human uh, types of proteins. In nature, there's as many as 500 different types of amino acids. That's an important fact, and we'll re go back to it uh, a little bit later in what I'm talking about. So peptides are, are linked amino acids. Alkaloids are organics with nitrogen, and they're highly bioactive. Dose is important for uh, a, a toxin. What you see up here is that 200, the 2007 radio contest Lady died from drinking too much water. She had two gallons of water and that was sufficient to um, mess up the electrolytes in her system and she died as a consequence. The point is that dose is important in terms of the relative toxicity of things. 
The duration of exposure, acute exposures, uh, generally we measure them by doing a day, a day long exposure to something. Chronic exposures are measured by doing month long types of testing. Age and size, babies and uh, smaller uh, critters are more sensitive to toxicity than uh, uh, adults um, and that, that are larger. The elderly also respond differently. So both sorts of things have a bearing on, on expressed toxicity. The exposure route. Injection is one way we use injection to give you a relative uh, ranking of the types of toxicity that you see. Inhalation is, is being studied uh, for uh, Cyanobac for, for cyanobacteria in, in the ambient environment. And we're finding that people are, have um, microsystem from uh, air, aeration types of things that wind up in their nose and uh, other passages. And then ingestion. And ingestion is important, especially for things that are hepatotoxins or liver toxins. The liver takes blood from your stomach and it filters the blood and it also winds up being a chemical factory in terms of treating the blood. And that's important in terms of how these uh, toxins operate. Species, uh, Gloria mentioned that dogs are more sensitive than human and we have a wide variety of uh, dogs and other animals that uh, having exposure to even hepatotoxins that passed away. Uh, it's fewer in uh, human beings. And the activity, are you swimming? Are you boating? Are you fishing? And the metabolism and what tissue does it accumulate? Uh, one of the things they're finding is that microsystem uh, not only accumulates in your liver, but also in your kidneys, also in your brain, also in other organs throughout it. So the, these are factors that influence its relative toxicity. There are others, an important qualification. And uh, as Gloria mentioned that it's not nice to see the dog swimming in this. It's not nice to see the human swimming in this either. And when in doubt, stay out. This is a list of different types of uh, blue-green algae, different types of genera. Uh, Gloria mentioned the del delicnospermum. Uh, there's another thing called Anabiana opsis, uh, cylindrospermopsis, cylindrospermum, lingbia, microcystis. The point is, if you take a look at all of this, the these cyanobacteria that give off microsystem, there is a wide variety of things that give that off and more forms are found each year. For the most part, you don't see a lot of uh, saxitoxin in freshwater uh, environments, but it, it does exist. Uh, and uh, uh, saxitoxin is a humdinger of uh, a, uh, a toxin period. So microsystem, Gloria mentioned it's the most common type of cyanotoxin and we find it uh, ar around everywhere. It's a cyclic peptide. What does that mean? Who cares what it's a cyclic peptide? What it means is that it's extremely stable in the environment. So when cells are lysed and the, the, the microcystin comes out and is in the water column, it stays around for a long period of time, weeks. It does not degrade very easily. And even one of the things about microcystis, um, uh, sometimes people want to, to have the number of cells that are actually in this. And the way they do that is they boil it and it still stays in solution. So it is a very, very stable chemical compound. Um, it's released from lice cells. So when people go to treat it with copper, what you're really doing is you're causing the cell to release all of the toxin that might be inside it. 
the guidelines for this uh, for for the WHO uh, guideline, uh, World Health Organization guideline, and for drinking water, the no measurable effect is one part per billion. So as people uh, are treating drinking water types of situations, they look to make certain, uh, and the level of sensitivity to the testing is really very, very important. Testing down to one part per billion is not easy. Um, generally, there's advanced treatment and ozonation that's used for the, that types of uh, drinking water things uh, um, for it. Okay, what about recreational exposures? Well, if you're out and swimming in it, the World Health Organization guideline is 20 micrograms per liter. That's 20 parts per billion. EPA reviewed the toxicity for these, these things. They came up with a guideline of eight micrograms per liter for adults and four micrograms per liter for children. Children are going to be more sensitive to this. They're more likely to in, engage in different types of behavior that bring them in contact with this as well. So microcystin is an endotoxin and it takes two to six weeks for a breakdown period under common conditions. So microcystin again, it's a cyclic pep peptide. There's more than 200 different types of microcystins, but it is microcystin LR, which is most commonly the uh, most toxic of that group and most, com most common. So what does it do? It affects, damn it, it affects hepatocytes and it, it, it has a chemical interaction with the proteins that are in the, in the liver. It, uh, it actually deals with uh, phosphatase types of proteins that are in the liver. And the bottom line is uh, things that integrate with that also are cancer producers. So it can impact other tissues, including the gut, the brain, the kidneys. It may act slowly from days to weeks. Cylindrospermopsin is a newer type of um, cyanotoxin. Again, it's an example of something that's coming north as a consequence of uh, climate change. The alkaloids are humdingers. If you're going to be uh, working in a university uh, lab uh, with saxitoxin, which is also known as a paralytic shellfish toxin and is the thing that's in pufferfish, you have to get permission from Homeland Security to even work with this type of compound. So it is responsible for uh, very, very serious types of especially in the ocean, less so in fresh water. Anatoxin A, also known as very fast death factor, um, is a neurotoxin. And it uh, affects acetylcholine. And both anatoxin, oops, my, my apologies. I gotta go backwards. There we go. Uh, so you have anatoxin A and anatoxin AS. They're different slightly chemically, but they both interact with acetylcholine, which is part of the chemical that's in nerve impulses. So what happens, they interfere with the acetylcholine, and especially when you are breathing, your uh, diaphragm muscles move up and down. Well, if your diaphragm muscles suddenly are uh, fixed and cannot move up and down, people uh, become asphyxiated. So the symptoms that you have from that are uh, uh, essentially that you ca cannot breathe. And it's part of that, part of that thing for doing it. Let's well, that. Now, one of the other modes of exposure for this is going up um, biomagnification, going up food chains, and also adsorption. 
both of those things are potential ways that fish and other types of things that live in the water can be, expo can be exposed to these types of toxins. What, damn it. Okay, when you take a look at uh, exposure to that, one of the things that they've done is they measured the amount of uh, microcystin that gets absorbed into different types of tissues in different types of fish. So you have three different types of fish. Here. One is a carnivore, one is an omnivore, and one is a planktivore. And what you notice is that if you go down to here, these are different types of tissues that are absorbing different amounts of the microcystin. Notice that the omnivore, the goldfish, is the one that is absorbing more of the microcystin than, than other things. Also, in terms of adsorption, remember how microcystin gets into the body. Uh, generally, it's by digestion. Uh, it moves from your stomach into the liver. And the liver is the place, even for fish, where the microcystin is most, uh, uh, where it is absorbed and it stays there to the largest extent. Much less so in the muscle. Well, what do we eat? We eat the muscles from the fish, not the liver generally. So exposure through this is less so than you might imagine as a consequence of what the type of uh, fish are that we wind up uh, using. So people have looked at that whole issue uh, of how you get exposures to fish. This one is, a, I will apologize uh, immediately. This is a story and takes a little while to explain. If you, one of the things that has been uh, associated with blue-green algae is uh, its relationship to neurodegenerative diseases. We're talking about ALS, um, Parkinson's disease, and um, Alzheimer's. Takes me a while to remember Alzheimer's, I don't know why. And so the compound that has been associated with that is something called BMAA or bis amino meth, meth, bis methyl amino alanine or BMAA. Well, there's researchers that are pushing uh, the idea that they have got a clear idea of some of the causative agents of uh, Parkinson's and uh, ALS. And it goes back to, if you take a look at um, residents of Guam, what you find is that the number of people that have an ALS-like syndrome on Guam um, eat uh, a product that gets, they have the cycad uh, nuts and cycad seeds. The cycad seeds are covered with a blue-green algae. The thought is that you have an amino acid that does not exist in people, doesn't exist in humans. It just exists in blue-green algae. That is spread into, according to the, the, this view of the world, it's put into different types of dietary sorts of things. The seeds from the guycad tree are eaten by flying foxes. And the folks uh, in Guam, the Chamorro, the native, for it, eat flying fox. And um, the, so the flying fox concentrates it still more. You see the soup made from the flying fox and that you see this BMAA all over the world. And it's been associated in other places with um, neurodegenerative diseases. The only trouble is that it has been refuted item for item by folks from the EPA, 
and for a in the Journal of Toxicology and Environmental Health. And what that review concludes is that the hypothesis of BMA as a neurodegenerative disease with uh, relationships with these things is not supported by existing data. When they say that, they have um, gone through item by item in terms of how that research is done. It is a superb piece of epidemiological research and it deals with something that is a very, very serious um, potential uh, in, in, impact form. One of the things that is used and what that relates back to this type of hypothesis is the use of serine as a treatment for ALS. The thought is that uh, the BMAA substitutes for the normal types of amino acids in different types of pro proteins that go into the brain. And that the place that they do the substitution is places where there's serine, which is another type of amino acid that people do have. And that serine can be used as a treatment for ALS. There is a phase one trial for serine as a treatment for ALS, but I encourage anybody that is interested, I don't have the name of the gentleman up there, but it's the Journal of Toxicology and Environmental Health. The title up there, Critical Review, is, uh, is uh, factual. And the bottom line is this is a very big issue. And when you take a look at a serious piece of scientific review, it does not look like it is supported by appropriate types of scientific work. So back to Gloria, I hope. Gloria, are you there? Here I am. Share. Whoa, where is it? There it is. All right, that was toxins. Now I've got mitigation. I love this picture. <laughs> Uh, this is not a toxic algal bloom. It's a green algae bloom in China. And uh, of course, not toxic. It's just really gross looking and I like to show it. So cyanobacteria is caused by an overabundance of phosphorus in the water. Cyanobacteria is phosphorus limited. No phosphorus, no cyanobacteria. Warm water helps, but is not necessary. Calm or still water, same. It helps, but not limiting. We have two main sources of phosphorus in our bodies of water. Internal loading is when phosphorus in the muck in the bottom or hypolimnium of the lake gets moved to the top or epilimnium in a process called turnover caused by seasonal temperature changes or storm action. External loading involves phosphorus coming in from runoff off the watershed. Farms and lawn fertilizers and manure from animals are big culprits, but so are more natural materials like leaves and grass clippings. The more impermeable surfaces you have, like pavement and buildings, the more runoff you will have. Once a watershed exceeds 20% coverage in impermeable surfaces, water quality begins to degrade. So we're starting with external loading. Uh, riparian buffer strips uh, is a strip five to 30 feet wide along a lake or river, and it is the last line of defense for keeping runoff out of the water. Uh, the uh, native plants have these long roots and they filter out phosphorus and particles running off yards and farm fields. 
And the native plants also provide native habitat and reduce erosion. That's my dog. Restoring wetlands. Wetlands, clean runoff, reduce flooding, re reduce erosion, and provide native habitat. Rain gardens, my special passion. Uh, don't overthink this. A rain garden is a depression filled with long rooted native plants. It collects and absorbs rainwater uh, so the water doesn't run off. You can run your gutter spouts into a rain garden or your sump pump outlet. You can put one of these on the side of your driveway to collect runoff. Try and keep all of your rainwater into your yard, in your yard. Re-meandering streams and rivers. This is a big project, though beavers are one way to get it done more cheaply. Many years ago, streams and rivers were channelized or straightened to improve drainage or permit more building on their shores. A meandered stream or river will have, will reduce flow, allowing for nutrients and sediments to settle and provide enhanced fish and other wild habitat. External loading, plant trees, of course, uh, especially native trees. In full sun, oaks, wild black cherries, willows are good choices. In park shade, try birch or maples. Not only will you reduce and slow storm water, you'll also be sequestering carbon and creating native habitat. No organics, even though leaves, grass clippings, and dog poop are natural organic substances, they still rot and produce phosphorus. Keep them out of lakes and streams. If you see a collection of dead leaves or water plants on your shoreline, remove them. They're great in your garden for compost. Septic systems. A malfunctioning septic system will leak phosphorus. If you are on a septic, get it pumped or inspected every three years. Don't drive on it keep trees and tree roots away from it, and consider replacing it with an aerobic digester when it needs replacing. Fertilizers. So when you are buying a big bag fertilizer for your turf grass, first, consider just how much turf grass do you really need? Turf grass is almost as good at producing runoff as asphalt. Uh, once you gotten your turf grass down to a minimum and you feel like you need to buy fertilizer, you can see on the bag, don't buy fertilizers with phosphorus or phosphates. The first number is the nitrogen, the middle number phosphorus, and the last number potassium. Buy fertilizers with zero for the middle number. Agriculture. Agriculture is a huge source of phosphorus in impaired watersheds. There are little, literally hundreds of best management practices that farmers can use to reduce phosphorus impacts on water quality. Here's just a few. Cover crops. Cover crops improve soil health, re reducing the need for phosphorus fertilizers and herbicides. They reduce runoff and erosion. No-till farming methods involve injecting seeds into the soil instead of plowing the soil up. This reduces erosion and improves soil health, reducing the need for fertilizers and herbicides. Grass waterways, I couldn't find a good picture for that. Uh, grass waterways are strips of grass land in farm fields that give a route for excess water to flow. The roots of the grass hold the soil in place and filter the runoff. Phosphorus management involves testing the soil before applying phosphorus fertilizers so that they are not applied where they're not needed. Uh, applying fertilizers only when there is no chance of rain. Applying injected liquid fertilizers instead of dry surface applications and avoiding winter and fall applications. Very quickly, I'm gonna zip through a bunch of internal loading uh, BMPs. 
Uh, there are hundreds of ways to treat lakes for phosphorus impairment. I'm just going to list some of them here. If you are working with a watershed or a lake owners group and want more information on internal load mitigation methods, Linda will send you uh, our contact information and there's going to be a second information just for uh, real serious nerds. First rule of thumb is you need to treat the external loading before you treat the internal loading. Uh, some internal loading methods are dredging, dry jet dredging, wet dredging, hydraulic dredging, reverse layering. This is where you pump sand up from under the muck and cover the muck with the sand that's not nutrient laden. Dilution, flushing, hypolimnetic withdrawal where you send the muck downstream. Uh, dye, they dye small ponds and reduce blooms. Algicides are not particularly effective and not good for the long term. Alum applications, oxygenation with aerators. And finally, advocacy. So most of the laws designed to reduce phosphorus runoff from far fields involve incentives. We all want our farmers to stay in business and keep growing our food. So we give them incentives so they're not losing money employing these practices. For example, the uh, federal farm bill provides incentives for farmers to leave a portion of their fields fallow. Uh, it's, it's not the same amount of money they would make for a crop. It's less, but it's, it's guaranteed income. Uh, Minnesota provides incentives for farmers to install riparian buffer strips. Illinois gives farmers a discount on their crop insurance and others. You can support sustainable farmers. You can encourage your county to have zoning order ordinances that discourage overbuilding. Some states and cities have bans on phosphates and lawn care products. You can join your local watershed group or start one if there isn't one. Here's a couple of students uh, taking, doing water monitoring on my watershed. Uh, watershed wa wastewater treatment plants need to be held to higher standards. Get involved. And that's all I've got. Excellent. Thank you so much, Gloria. Thank you so much, Jim. A very, very educational uh, uh, presentation. Uh, we might have needed a, a, an advanced degree in microbiology to understand some of it, but uh, so much the better. You challenged us. I have a couple of questions before we uh, move on to questions from the audience. Are nitrogen and potassium not issues here? Do we not are we not concerned about them? Only phosphorus, is that correct? No, you are concerned about nitrogen as well. And some of the research work that has been done indicates that the, the, nit the nitrogen budget is almost as important as the phosphorus in terms of getting expressed toxicity. And that's, uh, they're finding more and more concern concerning that. Gloria, why don't you, you mention who your lab partner was that you talked about? Um, so, yeah, um, so as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, you, you won't know a toxic algal bloom is toxic unless you test it. They have a gene uh, that produces the toxicity and something turns that gene on and they start producing toxins. This is a, uh, a topic of a lot of current research. My uh, lab partner this summer uh, was doing exact, exactly that. She had uh, ponds set up where she was manipulating the amount of nitrogen in each. Uh, she has not found anything out yet, uh, but it's an ongoing topic. Um, so yeah, now we're not sure how much nitrogen has to do with toxic algal blooms, maybe quite a bit, um, but it's not known. But Nitrates are not good for people, uh, you, so you don't want it in your drinking water, even if it's not going to relate to a lot of algal blooms. And the work that they're doing out in Lake Erie involves taking a look at nitrogen to a much greater degree than they ever have before, and the relationships between uh, different forms of nitrogen in terms of uh, what is the stimulus 
to the toxicity itself, um, as opposed to just uh, how, how fast it drops. Uh, one more question before we get to the audience questions. Um, is it correct to, to understand that if the phosphorus simply uh, leaches down into the aquifer, that there is a filtration process built into that uh, that uh, prevents the phosphorus from reaching the waterways? Is that correct? Um, no. <laughs> okay. Um, what's up is that th there's a couple of different forms of phosphorus and different ways in which people measure it. Total phosphorus is something where they take um, uh, acid and do a digestion and they get everything that's in the water column, uh, including uh, dissolving things uh, like the algae itself, and then measure the amount of phosphorus that's there. Then there is something called soluble reactive phosphorus. As you get pho phosphorus in a farmer's field as it's been fertilized, and water leaches it down and into the, uh, into the soil, there is less sediment um, bound phosphorus. And if you have a drainage uh, pipe that's there, then the possibility exists of picking up soluble reactive phosphorus as part of, uh, part of that mar margin. The SRP is extremely important because that's bioavailable. Some of the phosphorus that runs off the surface that's bound to sediment is not necessarily, there's only a certain percentage of that that's bioavailable. Also, when you have sewage treatment plants, almost all of it is soluble reactive phosphorus and it will be bioavailable. So discerning what the phosphorus source is winds up being an important part of watershed work. Well, very good. Rosemary and Linda, do you want to um, sort through the questions from the audience and, and pose them to Gloria and Jim? Sure. Uh, Rosemary, why don't you take the first one? Well, you know what? I wanted to say something on my own. Jim, when you were talking about the lady drinking water, you meant she was just drinking just plain water that wasn't oh. toxic, right? And right. that it was the amount of it was what threw off her. Um, right, dose is important in terms of defining what a toxin is. Right. And in the case of you use water because people uh, believe that water is not going to be a toxic substance for them. But if you drink too much of it, yes, it can be. The point being that if you take a look at any of these things, it's important to understand the types of dosing that's taking place. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, we have the first one from Marilyn Fish, who wants to know, is there a kit to purchase to test your water? Now, Marilyn, I'm not sure if she means the water in your local lake, water. or is, is she, we're not talking about tap water here. Let's, Gloria, assume, go for it. let's assume it's her lake. Yeah. Uh, yes, there are uh, kits you can buy, uh, not for all the toxins. Uh, they run about $30 per test. Um, and send me an email, Marilyn, I can hook you up. Uh, but you only can test for one toxin at a time. Uh, as we've said over and over, uh, microcystin is the most common toxin, so that, that would be the, the preferred test. I can okay. yeah, I question give information to Linda and she can uh, send it in the follow-up. Yeah, we could put some in the follow-up in the thank you for coming email you'll get sometime this week. Um, got a question from um, Susan and I think uh, someone else asked pr practically the same question. If you're camping and you are using an activated carbon filter cartridge uh, on the water pump and you're, you're drinking the water, is it gonna get the toxins out, the cyanobacteria? Just, is it a size thing? Do we have to go to the size? 
I, I simply would not know. I yeah, don't I, know. Uh, I don't. Drinking water is at a, a very, very low value in terms of its uh, World Health Organization guidelines. And for purposes of camping, I simply can't give you a good answer. Yeah, I, I, I just wouldn't do it. Um. <laughs> Um, well, when we used to go to the Boundary Waters, we used to dip our cup into the water and just drink. I don't know if we can do that anymore, but that you know, that's common, a common practice. Yeah. The story of that, uh, the couple and the baby and their dog that died in California this summer. Mm -hmm. And they're still trying to see if that's linked to a uh, cyanobacteria bloom. I do know that uh, microcystin, uh, you can boil it. And it's still there and still viable. You can, so yeah, I, I wouldn't be drinking any. Um, well, let me just interrupt. What do you do if you're out camping? <laughs> uh, you, you need water. What, what do you do? I would presume to bring water in and have a separate source. Okay. Is it, is it possible to get the filters that go down below the size of the organisms, because there are some filters I know that filter out things that are above, you know, 0.5 micrograms and so on. Well, I do, so uh, I, oh. Go ahead, Gloria. I, I have been to a couple of webinars uh, for drinking water treatment plants, um, but I'm, I'm not that up on it, but, but they do try to remove the uh, back the cyanos whole. You, you don't want to break the cells open because then you're releasing the toxins. But but they they can and do at drinking water plants. So I, I guess you know there is a way. But I'm I'm not the one to tell you. Yeah, some, of, some of the cyanobacteria are in the range of uh, two to three microns. So it's incredibly small, and they will go through uh, lots of uh, different types of filters. Rosemary, you want to take uh, the one from Chris? I sure will. Um, Chris has a, it's a little long. Uh, Chris Haywood says, we had a blue-green algal bloom in front of our house this summer and reported it via the EPA crowdsourced app. I was then told that our lake is tested at a beach nearby which did not have the bloom. Why don't they test where the bloom, blooms are actually reported? But um, are you in Lake County? Were we talking about the Lake County Health Department? Uh, let's, uh, let's get Chris, uh, let's see if she's around. Yes, yes, I, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I live in Lake County. I live in, on the chain of lakes. Yep, I've had the, uh, the same experience where I, I've sent them a, a sample that's got uh, 200,000 parts per billion. I mean, an extremely uh, toxic sample. And then they'll go out and test 20 feet down where it's not as accumulated. Uh, yeah, I don't... Uh, right, I was, I was told that, that they... I mean, we, the, the bloom was, you know, I could see it several homes down going down the way and the way that we're situated the lake flows in through this this beach area where they test and everything piles up then just past that on our side of the lake and i i said they're they're never going to have anything on their beach and she said well that's where we test every two weeks because it's considered a public beach and yeah. that's the lake county health department you're talking um, about um, yep. yes you can Chris, you can also take a sample yourself, wear gloves, and bring it into them uh, and ha have them tested. Okay. That's a possibility. That's a possibility. Okay. And uh, in, in general, my experience hasn't been as bad as Gloria's. Um, uh, I you find that if you ask them and you specifically identify that you're concerned about toxic blue-green algae, they will take a sample of a bloom, uh, a, a identified bloom. Okay. And, and a follow-up to that too would be that, um, I know the lake, that, the particular lake that we live on in the chain, which is not a lot different than any other uh, lakes in the chain, 
um, it's it's listed as like the second to last in the list of clearness in the lakes of of the entire state. I mean, it's so murky that you can barely see your hand an inch underwater. My question would be with these algal blooms, algal blooms that we get, I mean, there's obviously living matter that's just in this water constantly. Would that not also be potentially toxic? Have toxins in it as well? Uh, you, you won't know unless you test it. Unless you test it, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and Chris, I don't know what kind of budget uh, your lake can put together, but at $30 a test, that's, that's just what we did. We test every Tuesday from June to October. Uh, and then if somebody has a, suspe a suspicious bloom, we'll, we'll test extra, but yeah. So this uh, would be up to the Fox Health, Waterway. The Lake County Health Department is just not, I don't, I think they just don't have the resources to do all the testing that needs to be done. No. Okay. And, and I agree with uh, uh, Gloria when she says that. One of the things that is needed is we need to uh, give Lake County Health Department more support to get a, a larger number of people on board there. What what kind of oversight does something like Fox Waterway Agency have on that type of stuff? I mean, they're supposed to be in charge of, of making sure that these lakes I, are I healthy. Isn't that a state waterway? They try to stay out of the state politics as much as possible. They're a state funded waterway agency. Right. Um, but they, they are, I don't know. I know they technically report to the state, but I don't know how that actually operates. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how the Fox uh, Water Agency works. Sorry. Uh, do you know, do you have any, um, any resources for the watershed itself, the, of where, where to talk to people about the water, the Fox Watershed? I'm in the Fox watershed. Okay. I'll send you <laughs> contact information. Perfect, beautiful. <laughs> that would be great, thank you. I, w I was actually gonna ask you where your watershed drained to. You go well, down to the Illinois lakes. River eventually and then down to the Mississippi. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Fox, the Fox, Fox River comes, up from, comes out from Wisconsin. Right. Because it is it the Fox River is the chain of lakes. Yeah. And then it exits and goes south. Okay, super. Well, we have another question. Um, are the specific toxins identified by their genes, and can you use a PCR test to identify them? What is a PCR test? Uh, um, a genetic a, test? You a PCR answer. test is a genetic test. Uh, it's polymerization something. And I don't, I've forgotten all of the specifics. Court. And the answer to that is yes, it, that's being done. There is research that is uh, being, uh, uh, being done to try and identify that very, very thing to see the differences between uh, uh, genetic strains of the particular bacteria or cyanobacteria. Well, PCR is polymerase chain reaction, and that's what they use on uh, COVID tests. And that's why COVID tests take several days to do the gene test because they have to send it to special labs and it's expensive. But I was just curious if there was a name for the common test then. Um, we use an Abraxas strip test. So, so we're not, we're testing for a chemical, not, not a, a living organism when we're testing for toxins. So you're not looking at the gene. Right, right. Uh, we, uh, there's a series and we have to lyse the cells or break the cells open, get the toxins out and then we're testing Okay, so right, so it's not the organism. No. The, uh, the organism is uh, identified under a microscope, but, but there is a DNA test that I'm sure my late group can't afford. <laughs> More questions? 
Yeah, Jim uh, wants to know, how about, uh, do we have problems with cyanobacteria in Lake Michigan, like Huron? We know that there are in Lake Erie because Toledo had to shut down the water supply to their, uh, to, to the people for a while. Uh, yeah, up in Green Bay, there are um, uh, some problems that exist on Lake Michigan. There's also shifts in the character of um, what they call the pelagic or out in the middle of the lake in terms of since the water is getting warmer, you're shifting towards some types of cyanobacteria. It's not that they're so toxic, but what they're, what's happening is you have a dramatic shift in the character of the underlying uh, food chains and the underlying basic ecology of uh, Lake Michigan. And, and they're more likely to be found like in Green Bay or, you know, little bays, little inlets where this, the water is still. But yeah, they are on Lake Michigan. I have Mary. no more. Rosemary, if you have any. No, I don't. And uh, but we've had a lot of compliments, uh, Gloria yes. and Jim, from uh, the participants who really have appreciated this information. Thank you. Yeah, good, luck with, managing, good luck with managing your life. Thank you so very, very much. Now, before we adjourn, adjourn for the evening, I uh, just want to ask you to flag a couple of upcoming events. On October 10th, Ann Lacey of the International Crane Foundation in Baraboo, Wisconsin, will join us virtually, again on Zoom, to speak on efforts to preserve all 15 species of crane worldwide and in particular, uh, she's going to talk to us about the efforts which have been successful to save the sandhill crane and the whooping crane. Uh, Anne likes to say through the charisma of cranes, we envision a future where people work together to protect and restore wild crane populations and the landscapes they depend on. So we're looking forward to Anne Lacey joining us on October 10th. On November 14th, we have an author by the name of John Hildebrand, who's also a professor at the University of Wisconsin, who will talk uh, to us about what he learned by paddling a canoe on many of Wisconsin's wild rivers. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. That's on November 14th. Uh, we will be skipping the month of December and then resuming in the month of January. Uh, Doug Auer, would you like to uh, remind people how they can become more effective uh, participants in defending our uh, environmental heritage? Sure, thank you. And uh, that was a very uh, good meeting. Thank you, Gloria and Jim. Um, I posted a link to our Woods and Wetlands web website. Um, there's uh, several things on that website. One is a calendar of various events and meetings that we have going on. And also a newer part is on issues, uh, which now is, is, um, is listing all of our newsletter articles or events coming up. So you can get more information on both of those. And if you're not a member of CR Club and wish to join, there's also a button there where you can join. If you join National Sierra Club and you live in our territory, you're automatically part of the Woods and Wetlands group. So thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank uh, you, everyone. Last thing. Um, yes, forward. one last thing. Um, uh, Jim Hildebrand's um, book that is the way we found him. He was on a chapter a day through Wisconsin Public Radio. Um, it's called The Long, Long Way Round. Um, he's paddled a lot in the Yukon, but uh, he'll be coming in November, and we're very excited. Pick up a copy of that book. It's a good read. Excellent. We're looking forward to that. That's on November 14th, and Ann Lacey is on October 10th. Thank you all. Well, thank you for joining us on another Woods and Wetlands Speakers Meeting. We hope that you will get involved and help uh, in the efforts to save our environment. And we look forward to seeing you again next month. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, folks.